Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming to the immediately post-lunch uh, talk. Uh, it is my immense pleasure to introduce Armando Solar Lizama, who is a professor at MIT. So Armando is one of the world's leading experts on program synthesis, and he is leading a group computer-aided programming at MIT. And before that, he obtained his PhD from Berkeley, and he worked on a new program synthesis technique called sketching, uh, which actually revived interest in program synthesis, and several people have since then you know, started working on this uh, uh, topic again, uh, me including. Uh, so that was a very inspiring piece of work. And over to Armando now to tell you more about the exciting things that he has been doing at MIT since then. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for today's talk, I decided to focus on some of the new stuff that we've been working on over the last couple of months in, uh, in my group. Most, uh, in fact, all of the work that you'll see here is uh, is still unpublished. It's at the stage right now where it's starting to produce results. So it's a very, it's a very exciting stage. It's at the stage where if you give me a hard question that I can't answer, it's going to make the future paper all the much better. So please do ask lots and lots of questions. So my, my group, the group that I've just started at MIT for now a little over a year, it's called the Computer Aided Programming Group. And uh, as the name suggests, a lot of our inspiration comes from this, uh, this field and this idea of computer aided design, computer aided engineering. So, computer aided design, computer aided engineering has been around at least since the 1960s. It was one of the uh, it was one of those applications of computers that had a very dramatic impact in the way people do engineering and the way people design things all the way from airplanes and cars to, to buildings. And it's kind of interesting to look at the way this field has evolved and some of the parallels with the way programming languages have evolved. So if you look at some of the papers in this area from starting really in the 1960s and really all the way to the 1980s, a lot of the issues that people worried about in this field were very much the same kind of issues that people in programming languages have been worrying about for a while. Things like, how do you organize your design so that it's easier to understand and easier to communicate? How do you manage these very large designs for something like an airplane or a building? How do you modularize it so that you can design different pieces independently and put them together? How do you do reusability? so that if you're dealing with a part where you have to make lots of copies of it with small differences, you can actually parameterize this part so that you have this parameterized part where you can create lots of instances of it for different contexts and different situations. How do you compile these designs? And in this case, what people mean, what do we mean by compiling a design? Well, something like taking your designs that you've made in the computer and building actual mechanical parts out of them using things like numerically controlled machines? Or how do you generate drawings so that the builders in the field and the, uh, the welders in the plant can actually use these drawings to, to generate these products? And even at this point, people were already starting to worry about very low-level checks, things like checking compatibility between different parts, what, uh, what you could almost think about as interface checking, making sure that if you design one part and you design another part, when you put them together, they're actually going to match. So a lot of these, a lot of these things are very much the kind of things that people have been worrying about in programming languages for a very long time. How do you create modular designs? How do you organize your designs? A lot of the literature at the time also talked about things like version control. How do you make sure that, how do you keep different versions of the same design organized? Now, some interesting things started happening around the 1990s. So for a very long time, people had already been looking at analyzing these designs from the point of view of doing, say, finite element analysis or doing simulations. But one of the really interesting things that started happening in the 90s is that 
people started really looking for push button design validation. At the level of these computer aided design tools, they wanted to be able to press a button and see how this particular piece that they designed was going to dissipate heat, for example, or how this particular piece that they designed was going to withstand vibrations. And so there was a big movement for taking a lot of these technology that had been developed for numerical simulation and actually incorporating it as part of these computer-aided design tools. So you could say that today something very similar is happening in the world of software, where a lot of these technology that we have been developing for a very long time for verifying programs, for checking them, for validating them, is actually moving into the mainstream. It's moving into a position where people in the field can actually push a button and check their programs, check for bugs. But in the 2000s, something really interesting happened, which is in this field, once that you have all of these decision procedures in place, once you have the capability of simulating your designs and of analyzing, people actually started playing with design synthesis and what people refer to as design optimization, which essentially in this setting means that you actually create a design and give it to the system and tell it, this is not just a design, this is actually an entire space of possible designs for the wing of your airplane or for the airfoil in your race car or even for the buttresses in a building. And you actually give it to the computer and have the computer go. And by relying on these decision procedures that they had built, developed over the years, get the system to actually help you with the design. It's, uh, it's interesting to, to look at, for example, race cars. If you look at how the airfoils in race cars used to look like, they were very geometric. It's the kind of thing that you can design with a ruler and a pencil. A lot of straight lines, very simple curves. This is the kind of thing that people would design by hand and then simply validate through the simulator. Compare that with the kind of airfoils that you see today, which are actually designed through this kind of parameter optimization, where you have very complex shapes, very complex curves, where you actually give it to the system and tell the system, I want an airfoil that maximizes uh, downward force while minimizing drag. This is the kind of thing that we would really like to be able to do with programs. We would really like to be able to take some of the burden of designing these very complex systems and leave it up to the machine to do it. Now, one of the interesting things about this metaphor relating computer-aided design and programming is that in the computer-aided design world, from the very beginning, from the very early days, people have been aware that these are not automated design tools. These tools are not called uh, computerized design. They are purposely called computer-aided design. And what does that mean? It means that we're not leaving the design to the tools. Rather, what we're looking for is a synergy between the machine and the humans. What we're really after is being able to exploit the knowledge and the insights that programmers have and combine them with the power of machines for doing very thorough design space exploration, for doing very detailed analysis of the low-level aspects of the design and really combine them together in a way that is to the benefit of both. This doesn't mean, for example, simply using the human as an oracle so that when the machine gets stuck, the human has to go in and fix the mess that the machine made. It really means designing from the very beginning, looking at these problems from the point of view of what is it that the human knows and what is it that the machine knows what is it that the machine is good at? And being able to combine the capabilities of the human with the capabilities of the machine to actually make for systems that make programming easier and simpler, that allow better productivity from the side of the programmers, that allow fewer bugs, and that ultimately allow our, the dream goal is to allow for designs that programmers by themselves could have not achieved. So this is the goal. And uh, in particular, what we want to do as part of the work of my group is we want to go beyond validation. The next frontier beyond validation is going to be to use the capabilities that we have to actually help the programmer come up with these designs and come up with these programs in the first place. So today I'm going to talk about three projects that, uh, that we recently started at, uh, at MIT. 
as I said, all three of these projects are relatively early stage, but I'm going to talk about what are the key ideas and what are the main results that we have so far. But all of these three projects are looking at dealing with three very important problems. The first one has to do with implementing complex algorithms. If you talk to a lot of people today, they will tell you, well, nowadays people don't really write complicated algorithms. They don't really write complicated data structures. It turns out a lot of people don't. But there are a lot of people who do. Ultimately, somebody has to write the runtime for the CLR. Somebody has to write the libraries on which .NET or Java subsist. And yes, even though modern programming languages have given us these tremendous abilities to reuse these complicated algorithms and these complicated data structures, so that yes, most people in the field don't have to worry about them, but ultimately, somebody has to sit down and write them. And for the people who actually have to sit down and write them, the tools that they have at their disposal today are actually not that different from the tools that people had at their disposal in the 1970s, except maybe for the ability nowadays to at least validate their designs. So we're going to talk about some technologies that could make that process simpler. We're also going to talk about another problem that a lot of programmers do face on a day-to-day -day basis, and it is the problem of dealing with this really large code bases. Dealing with programs that are so large that not, single, that not a single person understands the whole thing. But, so we want the machine to help us reason about these programs, to help us understand what's going on with these programs, and help us with the problem of going and adding functionality to these programs, of building functionality on top of these very complicated frameworks. This is a very important problem and a very difficult one because these programs are at the scale where not only humans have a very hard time understanding them, but even our current analysis capabilities also have a very hard time understanding them. And finally, we're going to talk about this issue of unpredictable environments. One of the things that makes programming hard is the fact that when you write a program, particularly when you write a program that is going to have to interact with the world in some form, you have to think beyond the common case. You have to really think about all the different possible scenarios that might arise where the, the main algorithm that is running in your program might have to do something a little bit different, might have to use slightly different code, might require some slightly different line of reasoning to deal with each one of these different corner cases. And a lot of times, this corner case arises not necessarily out of the specification, but out of some properties of the programming tools. So let's... Uh, so to deal with these complicated algorithms, I'm going to talk about this idea of storyboard programming. And the key idea is we want to turn the programmer's graphical insights into code. So this is work with the student, Rishav Singh. We're also going to talk about this project called Matchmaker, which is really a case study in data-driven synthesis and in using large amounts of data about the execution of the program to actually help the programmer come up with pieces of code that are needed in order to fulfill a particular programming task. And finally, I'm going to talk about this project with uh, Jin Yang dealing with specification-based hardening, which is again, which, where the idea is to use symbolic reasoning to make program more robust, to allow programmers to cope with some of these unexpected situations. So any questions up to this point? All right, so let's start with this idea of storyboard programming. So this is really a metaphor. Um, a lot of animated films today actually start their life as a storyboard. And what is this storyboard? Well, the storyboard, what it is, is it's a sequence of frames that describes the action in the movie. It essentially describes the sequence of events that are going to happen as the movie progresses. And it's a great mechanism for communicating the insight, in this case of the creative writers and, uh, and artists, communicating their insight to this very rigid and very uh, rule-bound structure, which in this case happens to be not a machine, but studio executives. So it's a mechanism for communicating this creative insight to the studio executives. And what it is, again, it's the sequence of frames, the sequence that describes the action of the movie. So now the question is, 
why can't we do the same thing to communicate our insights and our intentions to the computer? So we've come up with this idea of storyboard programming, and it's particularly geared to programs like data structure manipulations, where programmers really start with this very high level, this very graphical intuition of how the program is to proceed. And then what they have to do is they have to take this very high level graphical intuition about how their data structures are going to evolve and convert it into a sequence of pointer updates, convert it into a sequence of destructive updates into this invisible heap that is completely conceptual. And what you end up with is this inscrutable mass of code that if you want to have any chance of understanding it, you really have to reverse engineer. You have to reconstruct from this sequence of pointer updates, this graphical intuition that tells you this is what's actually going on in your data structure. So what do we want is we want to allow programmers to convey their insight in the form of a storyboard. And what is this storyboard? The storyboard it is essentially a cartoon version of this data structure transformation. In this case, for example, you can see that what we're trying to do is we are trying to insert an element into a linked list. So we start with a linked list where A happens to be less than X and B happens to be greater than X. And then we finish with the same data structure where now X is sitting there right in the middle. Now, in addition to this, we want to provide the system with some structure. Some structure that tells the system the kind of solutions that we're looking for. In this case, this, uh, you can call this a sketch or a scaffold. It's really providing the control flow structure of the solution that you expect. But the key insights really come from here, from the storyboard, which is providing, which is get, telling you a story. It's telling you about how this data structure is going to evolve in the process of doing this data structure transformation. This storyboard is actually composed of different scenarios. Each one of these different scenarios corresponds to different situations, different cases that the input is going to have to deal with. In this case, in addition to the common case where the data structure, where you're inserting into the middle of the data structure, you have to worry about the case where you're inserting at the end, where you're inserting at the beginning, where you're inserting into this empty data structure. So the storyboard is essentially providing the scenarios. Yes? Ordered box means something special to the... Yes, this is an excellent question. So one of the things that you see here is, one way to think about this is, this is essentially an input-output pair. This is essentially an example that says, when you get a list like this, you want to produce a list like this. But it's more than an input-output pair because we're using some abstraction here. What we're really telling the system is you're going to get this list. And there is this part of the list that is just some series of notes that uh, you don't particularly care about. And then there is the interesting part, the part where you're actually going to be modifying and inserting the thing. And then there's, again, this boring part that just contains a lot, a lot of notes. And when you're done, the front part is going to be the same, and the back part is going to be the same. And what's, the change is going to happen here in the middle where this is where the important stuff happens. So is this not about uh, inserting in a sorted list? Yes. So, but you should have some kind of a predicate saying that x is between a and b, right? Yes, that's, that's absolutely not. right. So why is that not in the picture? Because I forgot. Okay. <laughs> so yes, you're absolutely right. So you also need a predicate here that says the fact that all the elements in front are less than a, and that a is less than x, and that x is less than b, and that B is less than all the elements in back. So this is the predicate. And uh, this is exactly the predicate that you need. And so the idea is this predicate is really part of the storyboard. It's part of the description of what's going on in this execution. And from that, the system actually synthesizes a correct implementation of the list insertion, an implementation that realizes that what it has to do is iterate over this front part until it gets to the interesting stuff. And when it gets to the interesting stuff, it has to go and insert into the interesting stuff by doing some pointer manipulations. And then it has to worry about different cases, like the case where the head is equal to null, or the case where uh, prev is equal to null, in which case you are inserting at the beginning of the list. So, this is the information that, that you want to provide to the synthesizer. So now the question is, what do you need 
in order to actually make this real. So the first thing, and really the most important thing, is you need to give semantic meaning to the storyboard. You need to be able to go from this very abstract graphical description to something that the system actually can manipulate, something that the system can actually reason formally about, so that it can actually tell whether what it's producing actually conforms to the storyboard that you provided. So the storyboard is, the storyboard as I said before, you can think of it as a set of input-output pairs, but it's a little bit more than that. The fact that you have this abstract notes means that the single input-output pair, what it's really representing is an infinite family of input-output pairs. It's describing the behavior of this program on an infinite set of input-output pairs. So this, on the one hand, helps you constrain the set of solutions that you want to consider. But it also gives you something very important. It tells the system what to focus on. What we want to do is we want to take advantage of this abstraction that the user is providing. The fact that the user is telling you what's happening here is not really that relevant. This is where the interesting stuff is happening. That's what you really need to reason about in order to reason about this data structure manipulation. So you want to treat the storyboard as a specification, but you also want to treat it as a source of an abstraction, as something that tells you what's important, what you need to reason about in order to get your algorithm right. So then, of course, you need to actually be able to use this insight presented in the storyboard to make the synthesis happen. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we deal with issues of expressiveness and scalability. So to see how we do this, let's start by thinking a little bit about, by looking in a little bit more detail at the information that we need to be able to extract out of these storyboards. So the first thing we're going to extract out of a storyboard is an environment. So the first thing that you have in an environment is a sequence of variables. Some of these variables actually show up in the storyboard. Some of them don't show up in the storyboard, but instead they come from the scaffold, the fact that you have this current and this previous pointer. So the environment, the environment describes those, uh, those variables that are going to be necessary to reason about this data structure manipulation. So, so who provides this? Is it the, uh, the, the creative designer or the studio designer? The idea is that this is provided by the creative designer. This is extracted from the storyboard. Right. Right now, we're actually at the stage of writing these by hand. But I'm going to try to convince you that this, all this is, is a, graph, a text representation of what you see in this picture uh, with a couple of extra things. So first, you have the variables. And again, the variables just come from the scaffolding. Then you have a collection of concrete nodes. Those come directly from the storyboard. The storyboard tells you that in order to reason about this, you really only have to reason about these concrete nodes A, X, and B. And you really don't really need to reason about any additional concrete nodes. Then what you have are these abstract nodes, front and back. So the system is also going to have to reason about these abstract nodes, front and back. And here, you also need to tell the system a little bit about these abstract nodes and relationships between them. In this case, the fact that front.next, in other words, any abstract node coming from, uh, any concrete node coming from front, its next pointer can either point to front or it can point to A. And in the case of back, the fact that back.next can either point to back or it can point to null. And finally, you have this invariant that says that the talk describes the relationships between the nodes in your storyboard. The fact that the front node has to be less than A and that A has to be less than X, X has to be less than B. This is something that the user has to provide separately. It's, it's an invariant about the data structure that you're trying to synthesize. So in addition to the environment, you have this scenario. It's actually composed of two frames. The first frame says, this is how things look like before I start the execution of the program. And this is how things look like at the end of the program. And this is just a text description of this picture. All it's saying is it's describing the connections that you see graphically in this picture. So now the key is that from this scenario and from the environment, 
what we're actually going to do is we're going to derive an abstraction. And this, in, in our case, yes? Yes. So somewhere in this, there's an implicit meta information that you're reasoning about null terminated single tests, right? Otherwise, you cannot go from this picture to what you want this. So there is, this has to be, I mean, that has to be a information that's provided by creative designer. In this case, it's actually not the case. So you can actually think of this, the, the only case where that becomes relevant is here, from the point of view of this predicates. All the information that we have here is the fact that this corresponds to some set of nodes, and that if you take one of those nodes and you do dot next on it, either it's going to take you to another node in here, or it's going to take you to A. But the picture has more information than what you were writing on the left. Right, so the picture has, the picture has in addition to this information, it also has this information right here. So why does the picture not show an arrow from front to B? That's a good question. So this is actually something that is part of our this actually something that is part of our description of the scene. The fact that this is really how the list looks like. At least the list that I care about, the data structures that I care about, this is how they look like. And from front, there are links to A, but there are no links to B. And I don't want also to be links to x or links directly to back. So I really only care about lists that look exactly like this in the beginning. And at the end, I want them to look exactly like this. Yes? So does the picture also implicitly say that the front zone is going to remain exactly the same as the front zone below? Like what about the links between the different nodes in the front set? Can they change or are they not supposed to change? This is a very important question. So right now, the convention that we're using is that these abstract nodes cannot change. And this is a very strong restriction. I'll talk a little bit more in a few slides about how, that, uh, how we can actually uh, deal with that restriction. Yes? So Mili and colleagues sort of dealt with the problem of giving a logical meaning to a picture. Yes. Like with shape graphs, and, and there's all sorts of hygiene conditions and all sorts of extra things. You know, a, a picture may be a thousand words, but you know, a few symbols are worth a thousand pictures. Right? <laughs> the same goes, right? So, so do you use more, more technically? Do you do you uh, do you give uh, a precise? Do you use their sort of uh, notions of hygiene conditions? And I, I mean, uh, are you using something like their encoding of shape graphs, or how does how does it compare? So you could, you could think of this as a cartoon version of shape analysis. Some of the important things that we don't have here and that we're trying to get away without are uh, the kind of elaborate predicates that you see sometimes in shape analysis, things like reachability Those predicates. Are very fundamental, like for example, you, know, you can't have, I mean, some are just obvious to programmers, but not to a, 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 a computer system. Like next can only point to one thing. A pointer can only point to one thing. In a graph, you could make it point to two things. But we know that the next field can only have. Right, so those things are implicitly encoded here. Ah, yeah, those... so that's what I'm referring to. Yes. And, 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 and there's others that, you know, that there's no dangling, no, there's no garbage, and all the sort of things you get when you really want to precisely describe the, what the picture means. Right, that is absolutely right. Are so essentially, there is a set of background, uh, there is a set of background conditions here. Yeah. In terms of I have question. yes, you, you want to go first? <laughs> Why are you trying to get away from the reachability predicate? Explic you said that explicitly, right? You don't want to use a reachability predicate. Right now, one of the things that we're trying to see is how far we can push this with very simple, with very simple predicates that you can get out of the picture with very minimal extra annotation. So it's probably you will probably need them for for certain complicated things. But uh, we're trying to see how far we can push it with just a very simple interpretation of these graphs, just based on very simple predicates and very simple predicate abstraction. Okay. So, so you just talk, so go ahead. So it's not, I don't think it's a big deal that the front and back can have change, right? Because you can always, you have another template to match and somewhere in the middle to change, you can specify that layer, but you can always have some units, complex units, which don't have to change. Having front and back not have to change. It's not, conceptually it's not. 
in practice, it, uh, if front and back don't have to change. It makes the algorithm a little bit simpler. In general, if abstract nodes don't have to, don't have to change, it, uh, it makes certain aspects of the encoding simpler. Uh, what I was saying is that going further, if you want to have some complex nodes change, you can actually make two complex nodes and between you can only get a change. You're getting ahead of me, but that is, that is, exactly, uh, that is exactly right. So I'm trying to understand, is it true that your, your, the, what you write at the bottom, this assertion actually means something specifically with the pointer structure? As opposed, I mean, when I first read this, I thought you were talking about sorting the list based on some integer key or something like that, but you're actually talking about the pointer structure here. So this is a very good point. This is not about the pointer structure. This is just a statement about the value stored in node A versus the value of the nodes that belong to the set front versus the value of the nodes that belong to the set you back. Overloading, overloading you know, the pointer values and the data values stored here, right? Yes, so that is solely for the purpose of presentation. Okay, yeah. This should actually be you know, front.val and a.val, except then it gets too long. I don't understand why you know the picture, why you know that the arrows go that way. That, you know, the picture, the sequence of arrows in the picture are very specific. Well, so this is the key. The key is what you're trying to do is you want to get this environment from the picture, not the other way around. So from the picture, you want to get the fact that you have a certain set of variables. You want to get the fact that you have a certain set of concrete nodes, a certain set of abstract nodes the fact that you have certain relationships between the pointers for these nodes, and the fact that you have certain relationships between the values of those nodes. And the pointer structure is really coming into play here in the description of the scenario, where you're stating very explicitly the fact that x points to some node in front, uh, sorry, the fact that head points to some node in front, the fact that a.next points exactly to b. Right. Yes. A. I don't see anything on the left that tells me that front should be pointing to A. But the thing is that he's not saying that the left is, has just as much information as the picture. Right. He wants to go from the picture to the left. So the, le the left is really, I think, perhaps an abstraction of the picture, right? Exactly. So because we have this rule that these notes and the, this abstract notes, we're not going to allow them to change, that's just a, a design decision. Then. Uh, this relationship between this point of relationships uh, corresponding to this front node are actually part of the environment. They are they are fixed. They are static in this case. But another thing that Tom pointed out was that you can also uh, use more sophisticated notation on the graphical side. You can have must edges or may edges, mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. that really I guess I'm well. trying to. That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. And I, I was under the impression at first that your left encoding is an exact encoding of the information. Pictures, so now you're saying no, it's actually just a subset of So together, this environment plus the information in the two scenarios, that those two things together uh, encompass the information on, in the picture. So, uh, so this is the basic idea. You have the scenarios, and what we do from the scenarios is we actually define a, we actually define a predicate abstraction over our domain of lists. And in this case, it's, it's something very simple. We have already our sets of nodes. So in this case, we, and we also have that every variable and every location in the, every, uh, every location in the program, every variable can point to a very specific set of locations. So we have that head could either point to this front node, or some node corresponding to front, and or to the null pointer. And we have that a.next could point to either b or x or to null. So essentially what we have is we have a set of predicates that define an abstract domain. And, uh, and so from those predicates, what we do is we construct an abstract domain. In this case, each evaluation of the predicates corresponds to a particular set of states. And what we have is essentially this power set domain, where you, uh, you can represent it as a bit vector. And 
every bit corresponds to one of these abstract states, which in turn correspond to valuations of these predicates. And you can actually frame this entire synthesis problem as a very, uh, as a very simple data flow analysis. So this actually borrowing from, uh, from the work of Swarab and Summit that, uh, and Sumit that, uh, that essentially tells you that you can actually do synthesis on top of an abstract, uh, on top of predicate abstraction. And uh, in this setting, it actually leads to a very simple formulation. So in this case, what you have is the scaffold uh, or the sketch gives you the structure of the solution. And what you're trying to figure out are what these functions, f3 and f2 and f1 and this f predicate, you're trying to figure out what they are. And so what this leads to is essentially a set of equations that tells you that there are each one of these f1, f2, f3, fp, and negation of fp, they are actually parameterized. They are actually parameterized by a bit vector in such a way that depending on the value of the parameters, you're going to get a different concrete piece of code for f2 or for f3. And so what you're really looking for is that there exists a value of t1 and t2 and t3 where these t's correspond to your bit vector representation of your abstract domain. And this c corresponds to the set of bits that determine how all of these unknown pieces of codes are going to get instantiated. And because we're doing predicate abstraction, uh, in principle, you can solve this in one shot. This is just a satisfiability problem that, that you can solve with one shot. And uh, an interesting uh, observation is that uh, if you're only trying to do synthesis and if you're not really trying to find invariants, you don't actually care to, to find the least fixed point. Because after all, if you find some uh, values for the different missing piece of code that works for any fixed point, then it's going to work for the least fixed point. So you don't really care about minimizing. But you also need to make sure that you've done this. That is actually very important. And uh, the fact that uh, what this is going to give you is this is going to give you partial correctness. So currently, we actually, uh, we're actually not uh, we actually haven't gotten to the point of doing more than partial correctness. So what this means is that this is giving you a set of constraints such that any solution to these constraints is going to satisfy your storyboard. Uh, potentially, it's going to loop forever. Is yes? Yeah, so actually one of the things that you have here is that your storyboard doesn't have to have abstract nodes, right? So you can also provide a couple of concrete input-output examples. And, uh, and if you have a couple of concrete input-output examples, then this just becomes a simple inductive, uh, a simple inductive synthesis. But how and do you know that? Sorry. Yeah. So, so if you just say while true and <laughs> semicolon, right? So that mm -hmm. satisfy all the conditions. So one of the things that we do require is that at the, end of the, at the end of the process you have for your final state, we actually require that the system finds a solution to the data flow equation such that the final state is identical to this. Now, sure, it could make up some values out of thin air and then, uh, and then say, yeah, here, here it is. It, it looks like it works correctly even though it actually doesn't terminate for any inputs. When you have concrete input-output pairs, though, you, then it really becomes like the inductive synthesis that we do in standard sketch, where we actually require termination after a fixed number of iterations. One of the things that, that we like, actually, about these constraints is that they are compatible with the constraints that we generate in Sketch. Which means, in Sketch, you can write, for example, a test method and say, I want my solution to actually work correctly for this test method for all inputs within this bounded uh, size. And I want everything to terminate for those inputs. And you can actually just take these constraints, combine them with 
the constraints that you get from sketch and get, uh, and get the termination out of that. So, so the first question is, well, does this work? And, uh, and the short answer is yes. So we've, uh, these are, are some of the experiments that, uh, that we've run, things like inserting into the linked list. It turns out if you want to delete from a linked list, then all you have to do is swap these, uh, these inputs and outputs in your storyboard. And then you get, uh, then you get a storyboard for linked list deletion uh, for free. Uh, inserting into a binary search tree is another, another interesting one. So you can see that the space of possible solutions that the system is considering is, is quite astronomical. The, the, performance is not, uh, the performance is not amazing. It's uh, of the order of a few minutes, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's reasonable. But when we started playing with this, <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that is probably true. One of the things we realized, though, when we started playing with this and with just this very simple formulation was that this formulation is great for scan and modify type of manipulations. Something like inserting into a list where the solution is of the form, you're going to scan through some portion of the list, and then you're going to get to this middle interesting part where you're actually going to modify it. So something like inserting into a linked list certainly falls uh, into that pattern. Something like removing into a linked list certainly falls into that pattern. Something like inserting into a binary tree certainly falls into that pattern. But something like reversing a list, for example, does not fall into that pattern. Yes? Sorry? What about splay tree? Splay tree also requires a little bit more than just scan and modify, because it also requires some restructuring of the tree. Similarly, in the case of something like a red-black tree. It's, uh, so in order to deal with those kind of manipulations, we really need more than this. Any question? Oh. So, uh, so dealing with more complex operations really require additional machinery. And uh, in particular, dealing with something like linked list reversal really requires some level of inductive reasoning, which this kind of abstraction, like the one that I showed here, doesn't really support the kind of inductive reasoning that you need for something like an in-place linked list reversal. I, I still don't, I don't quite see what is the difference between the two. What, what is the difference between inserting and reversing? I'll show you in a second. I think this example will make it very clear. Okay. So let's say I want to insert into a linked list, and uh, uh, reverse a linked list. So one way I can describe it is as follows. I'm going to have this uh, head node A, and then it's going to point to some middle part of the list, and then that is going to point to some end of the list Z. And what I want to get is, I want to get essentially the same thing but, but backwards. And here's the thing. The way this linked list reversal works is that you essentially, this middle part, you actually have to break it down into two separate pieces. And the way this in-place linked list reversal happens is that you have one part of the list that you've already reversed and that is already pointing backwards. And you have another part of the list that is still pointing forward. And essentially, you have to keep pointers pointing to the edges of that gap in the middle where the list goes from pointing backward to pointing forward. And what happens is that every iteration, this gap moves by one step. And so in order to reason about this kind of transformation, you really need to reason about what's going on in this middle part to a much greater level of detail than what the rules that I described earlier allowed. If you remember, one of the things that we said here is that these abstract nodes, we don't want to let the system uh, go and modify them. We want the system to come up with solutions that don't require modifying this abstract node. And in the case of this kind of iterate, uh, scan and modify algorithms, that is perfectly reasonable because then the part that you scan, that's the part where you abstract. And then when you get to the part where you modify, that's where all the detail is. And then you work on that part that has the detail and you get your scanning and modify. With something like reversing a linked list, you can't quite do that. You really need to be doing modifications in this abstract part of the list. And the way we get away with this is by providing additional inductive invariants 
So in this case, what the programmer has to describe is the fact that this middle part actually corresponds to uh, some node. And I use A, but it really shouldn't be A. It's really some new uh, node connected to this middle part or just some individual node. In other words, this is a way of describing that this middle part, it's really a sequence of nodes, a non-empty sequence of nodes. So now we are saying something very specific about how this middle part looks like. We are giving it this inductive invariant that the system now can use to reason about what's going to happen in the middle of this algorithm. And so how do you deal with this kind of inductive invariance in the context of, uh, in the context of abstract interpretation? Well, the important part happens right here in the body of that while loop. Because in the body of that while loop, you need to reason about when you have to unfold this abstraction and when you have to fold it back so that eventually you reach a fixed point. And when you're dealing with uh, shape analysis, this is actually one of the tricky aspects of shape analysis. The fact that the shape analysis engine has to figure out this kind of inductive definitions of your data structure. It has to figure out when to expand these abstract nodes and when to collapse them into a single abstract node. In this case, on the other hand, because we're doing synthesis anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to explicitly introduce these fold and unfold operations as part of the basic operations that the system can come up with. Just like for this part, just like the system can uh, choose between doing a pointer assignment or doing a different pointer assignment, it can also choose just to insert an unfold operation or a fold operation. And so the idea is that the synthesized program is actually going to tell you exactly where you need to unfold and where you need to fold in order for the after interpretation to actually work, in order for you to actually reach a fixed point. And so once you introduce this fold and unfold operations, then the job of the synthesizer and the abstract interpretation becomes very, very similar to what we had before. The only difference is that now you have this new extra operation that when you apply fold into something that looks like this, then you're going to get something that looks like this. When you apply fold to something that looks like this, you're going to get something that looks like this. When you apply unfold, then it's non-deterministic. You can either get this or you can get this, and you don't know. Yes? So essentially, you're telling me that you are going to synthesize these fold and unfold instructions. Exactly. So the code that is synthesized is going to have explicitly there. It's going to tell you, this is where you fold. This is where you unfold. And you fold on whatever this pointer is pointing to. And you totally the dual of you know, what we do in verification, where we have these synthetic instructions sort of in our code just to guide the, the, the check. That's exactly whatever. right. And you will actually also have to sort of synthesize those even though they have no runtime effect. That's exactly right. Because even though they have no runtime effect, from the point of view of making the abstract interpretation work, they are crucial. And any solution that doesn't have them, it's not going to verify according to the abstract interpreter. So that's the basic idea. Now, what are the big obstacles in order to make this work? The biggest obstacle is that when you have something like this, your abstract domain can start growing. And it can start growing quite a bit. So for this example, we have something of the order of 7 to the ninth possible abstract state. So what that means is that your space is now partitioned into your infinite space of lists is now partitioned into 7 to the ninth possible states. Well, it's not that much until you realize that you actually have a power set domain. So, it's true. It's, it's the fact that in the previous setting, what we had was when we wanted to do one-shot synthesis, essentially what we had is this T1, T2, and T3 had to have one bit right there for every one of those abstract states. So what that means is that now the width of T1, T2, and T3 has to be 7 to the 9th. And having T1 and T2 and T3 have a width of 7 to the 9th, which gives you then a search space of 2 to the 7th to the 9th, then uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so how can we deal with this? This, uh, this, uh, this kind of sounds like a, like a showstopper, right? 
Um, well, it's, uh, we have a trick under our sleeve. So, so what is this trick? So before, when we were doing sketching, we had this algorithm for doing counterexample guided inductive synthesis. And the idea of counterexample guided inductive synthesis is that you have automated validation. And as part of these automated validation, and, uh, and so what you have is you have this inductive synthesizer that has some concrete inputs. And based on those concrete inputs, it's going to synthesize something that works for those concrete inputs. And it doesn't care what else happens in the world. It just cares that for those inputs, it works. And so that solution is thrown down the fence to an automated validation procedure that then goes and checks whether this is indeed correct or not. And in the case of Sketch, that was just a symbolic model checker. In the case of uh, sequential things, it was just spin in the case of concurrent things. But what you wanted to get out of that was a counterexample input. And so by following on this idea of inductive synthesis, the idea is that you never have to instantiate this problem that says, for all possible inputs. Instead, you only instantiate it for a small number of inputs. And from that small number of inputs, you get a solution that happens to generalize, that happens to generalize for all inputs. So what do we want to do is we want to expand this idea in the context of abstract interpretation. Now, why is it tricky to expand this in the context of abstract interpretation? Well, the problem is, if you do abstract interpretation here, what you're going to get out of it is not a uh, what you're going to get out of it is not a counterexample input that says, oh yes, this counterexample input is where your concrete solution fails. And moreover, because we're doing abstraction, we don't want to do inductive synthesis on a concrete input and on, in the concrete space. We really want to do this in the abstract setting. So how in the world do we do this? How in the world do we combine this idea of counterexample guided inductive synthesis with the kind of abstraction-based synthesis that we're doing here. And the idea is very simple. For validation, we're going to do this abstract interpretation. It's, it's really just a, a, a very simple data flow analysis in this case because of the fact that we have our explicit fold and unfold instructions there. And so what you have is you have your control flow graph and you start doing data flow analysis. And, uh, and what happens is uh, you start iterating over this loop part until you get a fixed point. And eventually, once you reach a fixed point, you find that for this particular program that you have, it's allowing you to reach a bad output. It's, uh, this particular program that you have is leading to a bad output. So you can actually trace back the chain of dependencies that led to the bad output. You can look at uh, this function, f3, for example, is really a function that takes some input abstract state and produces some output abstract state. And you can look at, well, what was the input abstract state that allowed it to produce this bad output abstract state? And then you can keep going backwards. And essentially what you get is a formula like this that says, well, when you take uh, this abstract state from the input and you apply this composition of all the functions corresponding to essentially this path that, that is shown here, what you get is the output. So this is very similar to the path-based synthesis that Swarab uh, showed earlier today. The main difference is that in this case, we're doing it, uh, we're getting this path by tracking backwards from the result of abstract interpretation. By tracking backwards uh, these, uh, these dependencies in the, in the abstract interpretation and one of the things that is interesting is because we're dealing with abstract interpretations, these functions f are non-deterministic. So, or you want to think of them as non-deterministic in the sense that for, for any given input state, they can produce potentially many output states. And one of the things that you want to do when you convert it into this big composition of functions is settle, uh, fix that non-determinism to the non-determinism that actually caused things to go wrong. So then what this gives you is this gives you a constraint that you can then incorporate into the inductive synthesizer so that the next solution that is produced by the inductive synthesizer doesn't fall into the same problems that the previous solution came about. And this is really the basic kind of constraints that you're going to be added. There's a couple of additional constraints that you want to add for technical reasons, things like 
the synthesizer come up, can come up with a really bad solution, a really bad solution that after thousands and thousands of iterations, it will fail to reach a fixed point. Now, you know that for the linked list reversal, that is not the case. The fixed point is actually reached relatively quickly. It's reached after, uh, I think in this case, it's reached after something like four iterations with this particular abstraction. And so you want to tell the system, look, if after three iterations, you haven't found a solution, you haven't converged to a fixed point, then, uh, you should not, then that's not a good solution. And you actually want to incorporate a constraint that says that's not a good solution. I need a different one and a better one. And in this way, the idea is to constrain the system so that it gives you only good solutions. So this, we're actually in the process of trying out. Ask me in two weeks, and I'll tell you how it works. Any questions up to this point? So there's no the counterexample essentially is this. It's a million person. Is there a way of doing counterexamples on the graph space? Like, uh, if you, uh, don't do, so you have your model, mm -hmm. which you gave all the, the answer you input from the environment, and then there's lots of the specification that you have done. So maybe you can actually give another input, another, another graph that don't do this kind of thing. She's observation, so said, don't do this. So there's actually an interesting question. One of the one of the questions that we want to explore is what happens when you provide richer things in addition to this input-output pairs. You have, for example, uh, you tell the system, for example, that in the middle of the loop, uh, right here, there is a particular shape that you don't want to see. Or there is a particular shape that you do want to see, that you want a solution to have this particular shape. And we think that that is going to be particularly relevant when you're trying to synthesize something like a red-black tree, for example, would you really like to say, well, here in the middle, there is this uh, rotate operation. And here is the storyboard for the rotate operation, uh, in addition to the higher-level storyboard for the complete uh, insertion into a red-black tree, for example. So, so this is basically the idea of doing, uh, of doing synthesis from the storyboards. And again, the high level point that you want to take out of this is that this is really a mechanism for providing the system with your insight about how a particular data structure manipulation looks like, about what are the interesting aspects of this data structure manipulation, what are the aspects that are relevant and the system really has to focus on in order to come up with a reasonable solution. So, as we said before, a lot of people don't write these big, uh, or a lot of people don't write complicated data structures. Instead, their job is to go in and go into this massive, giant piece of code that is already sitting there. Lots of people have worked on it, and now they have to go and add functionality to it. They have to use this massive framework to build a new application, but not from scratch, but using the functionality that the framework provides. And this kind of object-oriented frameworks that are very popular today, they have really revolutionized programming. They are very much designed around flexibility and extensibility. And overall, this is a really good thing. It has been a great way to improve programmer productivity. It facilitates reuse. And it's really easy to write very rich applications that deliver lots of functionality with relatively little code. But unfortunately, there are also unintended consequences to the use of this massive, large-scale, object-oriented frameworks. And it's the fact that in order to be extensible, in order to be really flexible, a lot of the functionality has to be atomized into these very small methods, into these very small objects and components. And you end up with this proliferation of classes and interfaces. And you end up with what a lot of people call ravioli code, where Everything has been chopped into tiny little pieces. And in order to do anything, you have to understand a dozen interfaces and half a dozen classes. And you go into one method and uh, trying to understand what it does. And all you see are two method calls. And both of them are virtual, so you have no idea what it's actually going to run when you call it. So I'll show you an example of this that, uh, that we've been playing with. So um, most of our work in the setting has been in the context of Eclipse. And uh, Eclipse actually makes it really easy to write your own editors and write your own tools on top of the framework. 
And one of the functionalities that you have in a lot of these editors is that you can selectively highlight the syntax and distinguish between different lexical elements by their color. And it turns out the framework actually makes it really easy to do this. So you can, define, you can differentiate between, say, a comment and a tag or a string and make them all come out in different color. It's a great thing to have if you're writing your own editor. And so we want to add this functionality to our own language. Um, we have actually been playing, trying to write an editor for the sketch language. And uh, you know, this is the kind of functionality that is a must if you're writing a new editor for a language. So let's start with what the programmer knows. Starting out, you know that you have this text editor. You're building a text editor. And if you go and you look around in Google a little bit, you find that there is, this actu there is actually this token scanner. And there have actually been studies that look at how people look, at look for functionality in this massive code basis. And one of the things they do is they guide themselves by what people in HCI tend to call smells, which are patterns of code, things like lexical clues that tell you this piece of code probably does what I want to do based on its name or based on how it's written. And so clearly, something called token scanner sounds like it's going to do the right thing. And if you look at the do do documentation, you see that, in fact, it does. The token scanner is the one that is responsible for telling you this is a comment, this is a string, this is a tag, uh, color it accordingly. So in the case of our sketch editor, we want to create a sketch editor. And we've created our own sketch scanner. And now the question is, how do we get them to interact with each other? How do we get the token scanner to be part of the editor? And so, uh, well, uh, what about just calling the set token scanner method in the editor, right? Then we just register the scanner and we're done. Well, we wish. <laughs> it turns out the story is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, it turns out that in order to actually make this work, you start with the scanner. And the first thing you have to do is you have to create what is called a damage repairer. And any of these people who study the smells would probably be flabbergasted at the fact that this functionality that is there to help you color code your syntax actually has to go through a class called damage repair. Who in the world would have known that a damage repairer has actually the purpose of, uh, of adding uh, this code to your class? To this date, I have no idea why it's called a damage repairer. But uh, then what you have to do is you have to pass your scanner to this damage repairer. And then you have to create this presentation reconciler and give set a damager and a repairer on your presentation reconciler. And don't ask me what this, this presentation reconciler is, because I have no idea. But that's what you have to do in order to get this to work. And so then, so what you have is you have actually a link between the presentation reconciler, the damage repairer, the scanner. And from those, you, uh, you can now get the scanner. So what actually happens is that the editor, through some chain of pointers, it uh, has a source viewer. And the source viewer has a configuration. And that configuration, the, the editor is actually going to call this method called get presentation reconciler to get this presentation reconciler. So it means that in order to get the framework to use your scanner, you have to create your own, uh, you have to create your own configuration and you have to overload this method called get presentation reconciler. And then when you create the editor, you have to pass your new configuration and give your new configuration to the, through this method called set source viewer configuration. So in, a, in essence, this is the code that you need to write in order to get your editor to use the presentation reconciler. So it's very complicated code. It's not just a matter of adding a little line of code uh, in a method. It's really a matter of knowing that you have to overload uh, this configuration class, knowing exactly which method you have to override, knowing that you have to register the functionality. And if you don't do all of these things, then it's not going to work. It's just going to fail silently and not color your syntax. So with the technique that I'm going to show you right now, we can actually synthesize this code. And we can actually discover for the user that if you have an editor and you have a scanner, this is the code that you need to write in order to make it work. And this, uh, and so this is really a job for synthesis. There are, so, there are other ways we could try to do this. We could write documentation. And in fact, Eclipse has really good documentation. But the kind of documentation that they have or with something like Javadoc is very fragmented at the level of classes. 
you can find what the source, uh, you can find what the scanner does, and you can find what the editor does. But if you want to find out how to combine them, it's a little bit trickier. In the case of Eclipse, you can actually find tutorials that do this. But doing with this tutorial, doing this with tutorials is a little bit trickier because if you have 100 classes, then that means that if you want to write tutorials for how every one of these classes interacts with every other one of those classes, then you would have to end up writing 10,000 tutorials. And a lot of times what really helps is actually going through these examples that other people have written, going through and figuring out how other people have used these token scanners. And that, a lot of times, because of all the interaction, because of all the reflection, because of all these interfaces, it really requires firing up the debugger and stepping through, putting breakpoints here and there, and stepping until you find exactly how these things interact and exactly how they work. So synthesis is a better answer. And what you want to do is essentially for the synthesizer to do this process for you, to do this process of analyzing the execution of programs and figuring out how these things interact. So the approach that we're following is a very data intensive approach. You could say that the data is where the human insight really comes from. The fact that lots of people have written editors in Eclipse. Eclipse comes itself with lots of editors, and each one of those editors comes with its own scanner. And it also has some editors that don't have scanners. And so people have already done this before in different ways, in different contexts. But you can actually record information about how people have done this before. And the crucial uh, novelty here is that we actually want to collect this information not just at the level of the source code, but at the level of the actual execution. We have a database of Eclipse behaviors that records how Eclipse actually works when it fires up, when it runs, when it loads different editors. And so the idea is to really break from this paradigm that says that if the user has a programming tool, this programming tool has to figure out things from scratch by running on the user's machine. By having this data intensive approach, you can actually have a situation where the programming tools are accessing a remote, highly distributed resource that actually contains this knowledge and this insight about how other people have solved this problem, about how this program executes when it runs. And you can use that to drive the program analysis tools. So, in our case, the, the tool that we have is based on three observations. The first observation is that if two objects are going to interact, usually a precondition for this interaction is that there has to be a reference chain from one to the other. If the editor is to use the scanner, then the editor has to have a, link, have a way to get to the scanner. There has to be a link in the heap between the editor and the scanner. So these, uh, this is going to be our crucial assumption as part of this work. And our goal is to find the pieces of code that actually make this connection happen. This is very important because finding these connections in the heap is something that is very difficult to do statically, particularly in something like Eclipse where you have a lot of reflection, where you have very dynamic behavior. But this is something that you can actually do if you're observing a database of program executions. You can look at you can look through the execution and find those places where these links get established. And then look at the sequence of actions that led to those things being established in the context of a particular execution, in the context of a very specific editor. And use that knowledge to tell the user and to figure out this is what needs to happen in order for this connection to happen, in order for the scanner and the editor to really start talking to each other. So, the other important observation is that it's always very helpful to imitate the behavior of sibling classes. So in the case of the scanner and this editor, lots of people have written editors. Lots of people have added scanners to them. So uh, there, there are even some, uh, some examples as part of Eclipse that contain their own editors and their own, uh, their own scanners. So by looking, for example, at how the XML editor and the XML scanner talk to each other, you can make inferences about how your editor and your scanner should talk to each other. And the final observation is that if we have many of these traces and if we have information about many of these interactions over time, we can use similarities and differences between these operations to look at what is specific to every particular instance 
and distinguish it from what is general. You can use it to distinguish between operations that are done by the framework and that the framework is going to take care of compared to operations that are really the responsibility of the programmer. So in our case, uh, we, have, uh, we have some examples, for example, using the XML editor in different contexts. And we have also some examples of another editor that doesn't use a scanner. And by combining the information from, from this, you can find uh, things that are common between the different uses of the XML editor. Sometimes the XML editor is going to get loaded one way. Sometimes it's going to be loaded a different way. Sometimes it's going to cache some information, so the initialization is going to look a little bit different. But there's going to be a layer of behavior that is common because it is the actual behavior that the programmer had to write and that actually has to run every single time you want to connect the scanner and the editor. And by looking also at editors that don't use scanners or that use a different scanner, you can distinguish between how much of that behavior is really specific versus how much of that behavior is, um, is general to making this interaction happen. So currently our database is actually very rudimentary. We have, we're essentially tracking method, enter, and exit. We're tracking heaps, loads, and stores, but at a relatively coarse level of granularity. Uh, we're also tracking the class hierarchy. One of the things that we are not tracking are things like anything that happens inside uh, Java classes, things like uh, java.util uh, containers. All of that we are abstracting away. We are, uh, and so a lot of the actual expensive behavior which, ha which happens inside containers, for example, we don't have to track because all we care about is that there is some container that is, has pointers to some uh, particular set of elements. So a lot of these events are ignored in the database. The database also contains some periodic heap snapshots to allow us to run these queries where we go through the snapshots and we look for connections between different kinds of objects. And we look for objects, uh, we look for the objects that we're interested in and we look for where they are connected so that we can track back, find the place where the connections between these objects first appear. It's a lot of data, but it's manageable. And notice the fact that currently we're, we're again not doing anything very sophisticated. One of the uh, areas that we're really interested in is how we can use abstraction at the level of this data to deal with the fact that there's a lot of redundancy in this data. A lot of things happen over and over again. And there's a lot of redundancy across different executions, and there's a lot of redundancy even within executions. So currently, with the way we're tracking data, we're getting about between 3 and 7 megabytes per second of real-time execution. Yes? Can you compare this approach with how uh, Jungloid mining could have worked, helped in this case, in the work on specification mining, which tries to uh, compute you know, temporal uh, relationships between different API calls? So this is an excellent question. So the big obstacle to something like Jungloid mining is that this is not a Jungloid. Jungloid mining helps you find these instances where you have an object of type A and you want by some chain of calls to get out of it an object of type B. In this case, it's, and so what jungle and mining is going to give you is it's going to give you this sequence of calls that are going to return an object of type B from an object of type A. In this case, what you want is something that requires a much richer knowledge about the runtime behavior of the program. You actually want to discover there's, there's three things that you need to discover. First is classes that the user needs to override in order to get the desired behavior. Methods within those classes that the user needs to override. And methods that need to be called within those methods to actually get the desired behavior. So something like this is much, much more, uh, it's much richer than, than what the jungleoid provides. And that's why you need much richer semantic information about the program than the kind of type level information that the jungleoid uses. The big difference with uh, code mining is that uh, in this case we're using the runtime information and it's not just the runtime information about one execution, but really putting together the runtime information about many different executions. And the thing that we get from the runtime information are these relationships, these heap level relationships that are very difficult to extract directly from the code. Good question. 
Yes? Uh, all of the synthesis, you always need a component that validates that your result is actually working. So what is your validation in this case? You have a user seeing the color appear in the browser? or? Yes. So at this point, the validation is essentially for the user to take the code, put it in the program, run it, and see if it works. This is actually a very good question. Data is a great way to learn about the common case, to learn about how people usually go about doing things. It's a very bad way of trying to find bugs, for example, or trying to find you know, that rare corner case that nobody thought about and that is going to get your program to crash. So in this case, the synthesis is really there to tell you this is how people usually do this. This is the accepted way of getting this functionality to work. And it might be that for that accepted, uh, it might be that there's, uh, there's this extra thing that you need to do in order for it not to crash. Or it might be that there is this rare input that is going to cause it not to work. But here what we're trying to do is get you a foot in the door to allow you to get that crucial first running version uh, where you can actually even get a hold of how this functionality is put together. What are the classes involved? What do I need to overwrite? What do I need to write in order to have any chance of this work at all? And again, one of the things that is crucial here is the issue of insight. In this case, there's actually very little insight that comes from the programmer who is asking the questions at this point. The programmer has just a very tenuous grasp of exactly how this functionality is supposed to work and what needs to be done. The insight is really coming from all of these other programmers that have written test cases for this, that have written unit tests. And from those test cases, from those unit tests, from those other instances where this has been used, is that you build the database. And from the database, that's where the knowledge and the insight is really coming from, more than from the programmer who is doing the programming right then and there. But still, there is a crucial aspect of usability in that the programmer needs to be able to provide at least this tenuous insight and this tenuous description of, well, this is roughly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get these two classes to talk to each other and to interact with each other. So I'm going to finish just talking very briefly about this, uh, this final project dealing with specification-based uh, hardening, where what we're trying to do, the basic idea is that in many cases, people write imperative programs or even functional programs we, uh, where you have a very prescriptive programming model that says you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and then you have to do this. And they do it really for performance reasons. They, they know what the algorithm is that they want to implement. They know how that algorithm it looks like, and they just want to program it. But a lot of times what you have are corner cases, corner cases where you have to do something a little bit different, where something has to, uh, where the user didn't enter the right information, where the permissions don't quite match, and you need to do something different. And there what you have is all of these corner cases that a lot of times you might end up having to write even more code than you have to write for the common case, even though most of the effort, most of the runtime time is actually going to be spent in the common case. At the other extreme, you, can, you have declarative programming where you can really specify things at a much higher level of abstraction, where you don't have to worry so much about all of these different corner cases. But the catch is that you don't have as much control over exactly how the computation happens. You don't have as much of control as to exactly what algorithm should use, exactly how the computation should proceed. So what we really want to do is to allow the programmer to write imperative code for the common case. And then to, for a moment, stop worrying about these corner cases and instead provide a declarative specification for this corner cases. A declarative specification that says, globally, this is how the program should behave. This is how things should happen when you run the program. And what you want to do is you want, as you're running, when you encounter these corner cases, you want to switch from this just concrete mode of execution, where the program is just running, to a mode of execution where 
you're really going to an oracle and asking an oracle, what should I do now? What should the answer be? What should this value be? And this way, you use the declarative specification to deal with these corner cases, while most of the effort and most of the computation is taken care of through the standard imperative computation. So the idea is that as the program is running, it runs into this exceptional case where it falls back on the specification and asks the specification, what should happen here? What is it that uh, I should do? And there's some amount of symbolic programming. And then after a while, that symbolic state gets uh, uh, flushed out, and the program continues doing its own standard, um, its own standard computation. So we've, uh, we, we tried this idea in, uh, in a very simple context. This context is a context of data processing applications. So there are applications where you have a lot of data, and you want to write a very simple program on top of these. So here's a trivial program. You want to get this table of census data. You want to filter based on the marriage status. And then you want to average. So it's a two-line program. How much simpler can things get? But what happens if maybe the spouses can be missing? Well, one of the things that you know is that you can take advantage of the fact that spouses, the spouse relationship is, um, is symmetric. It's done? Yeah, I think we should wrap up. All right. Well, so, uh, so I think uh, we, can, uh, we can conclude. And uh, the conclusion is this is a case study for a much richer programming paradigm where we want to be able to deal with some aspects of the computation in an imperative manner and with some aspects of the computation in a constraint-based manner. And we want to use non-determinism in the programming model to connect the two, to tell the system, this is where you can use, uh, this is where you should use the declarative model, this is where you should use the imperative model. And we're studying right now some applications beyond data processing to security and privacy. So, uh, so that's probably it. We can, uh, I guess we can continue the discussion outside if, uh, if you want. Okay. Great. Thank the speaker. Mm -hmm.